Hi. Hello all. We're in The Misuse of Disfellowshipping, page 379 of In Search of Christian Freedom. The Misuse of Disfellowshipping in the Cradle of Democracy. Ray says, perhaps nothing illustrates more clearly the extremes to which the zeal to spy out and deal summarily with any disagreement or disaffection can go than what happened in Athens, Greece, the land called the Cradle of Democracy. In 1986, intense organizational pressure came upon George Christoulis in Athens. A former special pioneer and an architect, George had shared in the designing of a number of the Watchtower's branch office buildings. As an active witness, a longtime elder, and a very able scholar as regards the scriptures, he was well known and respected throughout the country. But his inability to support conscientiously certain organizational positions and teachings brought him growing pressure and criticism. Convinced that he was being targeted for disfellowshipment, he and his wife made a trip to the United States. He knew several of the governing body members personally, and as he said, his hope was to talk to at least some of them and see if they could recognize the need to make adjustments to avoid the injustices going on, not simply in his own case, but generally. He said he doubted that he could succeed, but felt he had an obligation at least to make the effort. He was able to speak with governing body member Lyman Swingle, the two couples going to a restaurant for a meal. But when he brought up his concerns as to the organization's demands for total acceptance of all its teachings and its condemnation of any open discussion among the membership, Swingle's sole response was to plead, George, don't leave Jehovah. After hearing this several times in the conversation, George's wife, Hambula finally spoke up and said, But Brother Swingle, that's the whole point. We don't want to leave Jehovah. We want to show that we put loyalty to Jehovah, Jesus Christ, and Jehovah's Word above loyalty to the word of men or human organization. That's the whole reason for our concern. Despite this, their questions went without answer. Perhaps because the governing body member himself knew that they were, from the organization's standpoint, unanswerable. George also spoke to governing body member Ted Jarez about unfounded insistence on 1914. Jarez's only response was to say with a smile, George, dates are not the important thing. The important thing is the preaching of the good news. George commented that when he returned to Greece, the very next issue of the Watchtower carried an article stressing the crucial importance of 1914. And that's a footnote on that page about that Watchtower, April 1st, 1986 Watchtower, pages 30 and 31. But he says, lists belief in that date's importance as one of the unique teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses that persons can reject only at risk of being disfellowshipped. Yeah, we, we personally know one person who was disfellowshipped over the issue of 1914. Not because she didn't believe it, she said she couldn't explain it. And because she said that, they disfellowshipped her. And then even you know, the, the thing that struck me here was uh, the comment of um, the dates not being that important. <laughs> I hear that frequently. Because when, when we brought up 1914 uh, with, with my parents, that was what my dad said. Oh, it's not important, and, and it's, it's not something that he thinks about, and he doesn't see it that much. But then later, when I was talking to him, he said, oh, now I see it all the time. So there's a lot of things that that witnesses don't seem to notice. Yeah. It goes on, upon his return, George was disfellowshipped in absentia without being present at the hearing. While officially cut off, he found himself almost inundated by visits and inquiries from persons in the witness community who felt similar concerns. Recognizing the need for maintaining spirituality, these persons began gathering together for Bible reading and discussion. 
the growing attendance at these discussions became known to the Watchtower's branch office in Athens, as succeeding events indicated. And then there's another footnote where Ray says, it is notable that if persons withdrawing from the Watchtower organization do not hold regular meetings, they are criticized as not obeying Hebrews 10.25 about gathering together frequently. If they do meet together, on the other hand, they are accused of forming a new organization. Yeah. And then he goes on, on Tuesday, April 6, 1987, a group of about 50 persons gathered at the home of Nick and Eftia Bozartzis for Bible discussion. From his balcony, Nick noticed two men standing across the, the street watching the individuals entering his home, some of whom had not formally withdrawn from the organization. Recognizing one of the two observers as a witness, he went down to speak to them, but as soon as he appeared on the street level, they literally ran off. Within days, three of those attending the gathering were disfellowshipped by elders in judicial hearings. On Friday, other norm, uh, others normally went to the home of Vula... Oh boy, I'm going to have trouble with this one. Can you say that? Uh, Carla... Carla Carrinu. Okay. Okay. We apologize to everyone with that Who speaks name. Greek? Yeah. A former witness, but since they planned to gather for the celebration of the Lord's evening meal on Sunday, they gathered on Friday, April, the gathering on Friday, April 9 was cancelled. The Friday evening, however, uh, Vula noticed a car with five persons inside parked across the street from her house, and the car and its occupants remained there for hours. The next evening, the same. One might think that to assign any sinister motive to such circumstances, viewing them as evidence of spying, designed to identify defectors and supply grounds for judicial action against them, would be the product of imagination, even manifest a degree of paranoia. Later events demonstrated otherwise. The following Sunday, April 11th, a number of persons went to Vula's home to commemorate the death of God's Son on behalf of all mankind. She noticed an unfamiliar car parked across the road on one corner and a van parked on the other corner. The rear window of the van was covered over with paper, but with a hole cut in the center of the covering material. The occupants of the car crossed over to the, to the van several times, talking with those inside it. Vula asked one of those who had come to her home to find out why the cars were parked there. When he approached the car, those inside quickly drove off. He then went to the rear of the van and looked in through the hole of the material covering the rear window. Inside, he saw a video camera, equipment being used by two witnesses, an elder named Nicholas Antonio and a member of the Athens Watched Our Branch Office staff, Demetra Zerdis. A number of others from Vula's home came over to the van and a policeman stationed at the nearby Italian embassy also appeared to find out what the problem was. The witnesses in the van managed to drive through the surrounding group and drove to a nearby park where they began quickly unloading their video equipment. They were interrupted by the arrival of two police cars and were arrested on charges of invasion of privacy. The video equipment was confiscated. The film in it showed Mr. Mrs. Rather Kalakarinu's home and zoom shots of the front entrance with close-ups of all those entering. Before the district attorney, the two men stated that they were only there to film a relative of Dimitra Zerdis, the Watchtower branch office member. His cousin, F. Tehia Bozartsis, mentioned earlier, had disassociated herself two years before. As a loyal witness, branch office mem member Dimitra could have had had no interest in her, certainly, should not have had any reason for wanting to film her secretively two years after her disassociation. Hmm. Spy movies. Hmm. Yeah, it does seem... But I've heard like stories. I heard them when I was an elder, of mm -hmm. ongoing spying by elders. So, yeah, as unbelievable seems... as it sounds when you read this, yeah, I, I think it's because you, when you hear those kinds of stories and you know the people, like the elders maybe involved, 
sometimes it seems unbelievable because you know them in a different setting, you know, uh, and, and it just seems like, no, I can't envision that person doing that. Well, I'm sure it was unbelievable for these 50 persons to what lengths the local congregation was willing to go to and the branch office. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll see what happens when the spy case comes to trial in the next segment. And I wanted mm -hmm. to link here on your screen a video we did on the seven characteristics of the Christian church or the Christian ecclesia because as as negative as all this is when it comes to fixing in your mind what's wrong with the religion you left mm -hmm. I think most of us never get around to examining the the contrast with the authentic Christian churches as found in the book of Acts mm -hmm. the the closeness of those people the the un, the unconditional love which was so characteristic of those hungry and zealous churches of the first century as detailed for us in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. So it seemed a good contrast to this. Uh, <laughs> this kind of this kind of judgment of those who once you were you felt close to mm. uh, as we found it was quite unbelievable when it happened to us. Yeah. But then yeah. we weren't prepared for what we learned later through Ray Franz and others about what the organization was capable of really mm -hmm. in any case. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next time the spy case comes to trial. <laughs>